Go ahead and take a seat. I told you last week, I think it was last week we were talking about this, maybe the week before, that as we go through this, uh, this amazing letter with its level of, of complexity, because it is a very complex, uh, very complex letter, that there were going to be times where um, I, I had intentions of getting through an entire message at one time in one sitting, and, and of course that didn't work out the first, for the first sermon. Uh, it's also not going to work out for this one. Uh, every time I think that I'm going to be able to get through an entire uh, series of, of, of passages here that are based on one particular theme, that doesn't happen, and uh, I do not want to rush through this. So this message we're going to do like we did with the first one. We're going to go through the first three things here related to what we're going to be talking about. In the next week we will, we will finish that up because one of the things I hope you've seen so far, not just with Romans but really anything that, um, especially that Paul wrote, his, his stuff is very organized. I don't know if, you, if you've noticed that. It's, it's, if you're, a diet, if you're a, um, uh, an outliner, it is really easy to outline uh, Paul's letters. Uh, he, he, he has a tendency to, to say this and this thing, and then he'll shift, and he'll, he'll move on to the next thing, and he'll shift, and he'll move on to the next thing. And he makes those very clear. They really don't bleed over into each other. They're, very, they're connected, but they don't bleed over. In this first chapter... He basically covers three topics, which we, one we've already talked about, one we're going to start talking about today, and then we'll finish up with the last one. The first one was, of course, the gospel. We talked about that in order to be able to write the letter that he is writing here. He has to make sure everybody understands what they're talking about when, when he mentions the specifics of the gospel. And then he shifts gears a little bit in these next verses that we're going to be talking about here uh, over the next couple of weeks. He talks about how the gospel unites believers. It is the thing that, that draws us together and makes us family. And then in the last part of the chapter, he shifts and talks about why the gospel is necessary because he gives us the status of humanity, that we are, that we are embedded in our sin and there's nothing that we can do about that. So we see those very clear three topics here that are all interconnected but very, um, very separated as far as uh, each individual aspect is, uh, is concerned. And I really love this because right after Paul here begins in these first seven verses in the opening chapter, and he starts talking about the importance of the gospel, the next thing he naturally shifts to is how that gospel then connects believers. God's word was written to and for believers. We have to understand that. That doesn't mean that unbelievers can't read it. I've known plenty of unbelievers who can't read it. Before I became a believer, I tried to read the Scripture. But it wasn't written for me. It's written, it, well, at that time, it was written for believers. It's written, of course, about unbelievers at times. But it's not, it's not written for them. And, and this is part that makes that very clear. Because what Paul begins to do immediately after talking about the Gospels, he talks, starts talking about something that we see a theme that comes up in Scripture over and over and over and over again. You know, as long as that book is, and as lot as a really neat things that are in there, you realize there's only a handful of themes throughout the entirety of Scripture. Really aren't that many different themes. The way they're manifested, the way they're talked about, yes. And one of the themes that we see keep popping up over and over again, John, John talks about it a lot, Paul talks about it a lot, Peter talks about it a lot, Jesus talked about it a lot. It is this idea that once you become a believer, saved, redeemed, born again, whatever terminology you prefer, when that happens, the scripture tells us, we talked about this last week, I, I'm adopted into his family. You, if you're a believer, are adopted into his family. And, and you're not an only child. That's the cool thing about it. When he adopts us, he doesn't just adopt us individually. We then become a part of a family. And that's exactly what Paul is talking about here. It's what he's saying here. Remember, he's writing to a group of believers in Rome. They have started this church. Has Paul, at this point, ever been to Rome? No, the short answer to the question is not. He doesn't know these people at all. Not even a little bit. And so what we're going to see here is that that's not going to matter to Paul because he realizes and understands and what God is trying to get us to see here is that we need to realize and understand it doesn't matter if he's never met them before, they're family. And he says some extraordinary things here because one of the, we have a tendency to kind of gloss over and past a lot of different 
passages in the scripture. We like them, we read them, we embrace them to a certain extent, but then we just, we just kind of move on. But in Matthew 12, verses 46 through 50, when Jesus was talking to a group of people, here's what Matthew wrote. While he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my mother and my sister and my brother. We read this and then we just move on to the, <laughs> move on to the next chapter. I don't think without thinking about the gravity of what Jesus is saying here. He's redefining family in front of our very eyes. He is redefining what it literally, not figuratively, this isn't a figure of speech. He is literally changing the definition of a family here. Now, he's not demeaning his biological family at all. It's not what he's talking about. He is expanding what the idea of family is because what links biological families? Blood. That's what makes my biological family members biological. That's the, that's the word. It's the blood that flows through our, in, our, in our veins, at least some parts of it, are the same. It comes from the same source. What links the spiritual family of God? The same thing. <laughs> blood. Not ours, but His. And He wants us to see this. This is extremely important for us to be able to understand. Now keep in mind as I get ready to read these passages, all these great and wonderful things that Paul is saying about his family about his extended family. He's never met them at all. They are complete and utter strangers to him, only they're not. And that's the point. Well, anyway, let's, let's get to it. We got, there are six of these things that we were going to go through. I, I, there was no way in the world we are going to get through all six of them. So we're going to talk about three this week. We'll finish it up with the three next week. But I want us to see here in these opening verses of the second aspect of what Paul is talking about, the second theme that has come up in this uh, amazing letter, is Paul showing us through, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, obviously God showing us through Paul, how we are to treat our family, how we are supposed to view them and embrace them. Some of them are going to be uh, a, a little, you, you, they're not going to be anything, there's nothing earth shattering here. We, we've seen this over and over again, but I think there's some little nuances here that maybe we could pay a little closer attention to, especially in light of what Paul's doing. So let's look at the verses. They're 8 through 17. Uh, that's, we're not going to cover all through uh, 17 verses. That's the last three for next week, but I want to read them all in context, context here. So this is Paul in Romans Chapter 1, beginning at verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son, that without ceasing I mention always in my prayers, mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at least succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation to both Greeks and to barbarians, to both the wise and to the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith, uh, from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for giving us understanding. Lord, I know that before I came to know you, this, <laughs> this word wasn't for me. I would never have understood it apart from you. Only because you saved me. You live with me. Your spirit now literally dwells within me. Am I able to understand and discern what you have in your word for me and Lord, for all of us? I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive what you would have for us here this morning. May you be lifted up and glorified. For it's in the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Let's get started here. Uh, we'll, we'll go through these relatively quickly. Expect 
you know, the last one is the one I want to, or the third one is the one I really want to kind of focus on here uh, a little bit. So how is it here that Paul is showing us that we are to treat our family? Remember, keeping in mind that he has never met the people that he is writing to. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith, faith is proclaimed in all the world. We treat our family by thanking God that they even exist in the first place and especially for thanking Him for their accomplishments, which is not always a strong suit of ours, is it? If we're being completely open, it's generally not a strong part of us. We, he was thanking God for their successes. They did it without Him. They did it without any of the apostles. They had no access to the apostles that were there in the Middle East. They were in Rome for crying out loud. And he's saying, not only do I thank God for you, I thank God for you for all the amazing things that you have been able to accomplish in His name. You could add in parentheses, without us, by the way. We weren't there to teach you. We weren't there to... He is excited about that. By the way, how successful was this church in Rome? It's interesting. We actually have some historical references to just how impactful that early Christian church was in Rome. There was a Roman uh, historian named Suetonius. Uh, he actually wrote a book called The Twelve Caesars. He wrote a history of, of, of the first twelve, or, or twelve, uh, beginning with Julius Caesar and then the eleven after him. And the Emperor Claudius was uh, was around during this time when the uh, church started in Rome. And in 49 AD, the Emperor Claudius expelled all of the Jews out of Rome. And if it weren't for Suetonius, we might have a difficult time understanding why he expelled all the Jews out of Rome. They had a very sizable population there. They'd been living there in peace for the most part. Well, Suetonius, this historian, actually tells us why they got kicked out. And they said because it was disturbances, not defined, disturbances caused by a group that he referred to as Crestus, which is almost certainly meaning Christians. So impactful were these early Christians in Rome that it caught the emperor's attention. He didn't like them, so he booted all of them out, even the Jewish people who were not Christians. He just lumped them all together because so many of the early converts, obviously, in the church were Jewish. And so instead of just saying, I'm going to get rid of the Christians... He just said, I'm getting rid of all the Jewish people. And he booted them out. And he was thrilled, Paul was, over the successes of the people. Why? Because we are on the same team. We are on the same side. When one ministry succeeds, we succeed. I can't remember if it was if it was first or second Peter that we went through recently, or maybe even back to First John. One of them, I, I can't remember the exact quote or remember the exact passage, but there was a point at which the writer said, "You know, we've heard about all these great things you did, and we are partakers in that. We benefit from that because of your successes, even though we weren't there and we didn't take part in any way, shape, or form." And how is that possible? Well, Paul tells us again under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? <laughs> but that as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our presentable parts are treated with greater modesty, 
which our more presentable problems do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, we all rejoice together. We don't think about that passage a whole lot, do we, when it comes to that? There does, unfortunately, seem to be too many times where somebody is in a place where things might not be going as well as they would like it to be, and somebody else is in a place where things are going exceptionally well, depending on how well is defined, of course. There oftentimes has a tendency to be a little bit of jealousy there instead of looking at it from the standpoint of saying, I am so thrilled. I don't even know you, is what Peter and Paul would say. I don't even know you, but I cannot tell you how happy. I am, that this is happening, that God is using you in this way. We need to thank God for our family. And and when they mourn, we mourn. And when they rejoice, we rejoice. And when they have success, we embrace that success. And when they don't, we pray that they do. This, by the way, is not a... Unique situation only to us in John chapter 3, verses 25 through 30. After Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, now a discussion arose between some of John, meaning John the Baptist's disciples, and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the river to Jordan, he's talking about Jesus. He who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who is the bride, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. You see what happened when Jesus was baptized by John and began his ministry. He was drawing more people than John was drawing, which is the way it was supposed to be. John understood that. His disciples, of course, did not. And they didn't like it. We see none of this with Paul here. He is telling us, you want to treat your family, your family, the right way? Then thank God for them and especially their successes. The second thing he tells us here about how we treat our family is by praying for them. In verses 9 through 10, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may at now last succeed in coming to you. I pray for you all the time. And I do not stop. And I have no idea who you are. I have never met you. He didn't know if he ever would meet them. He said he hoped he would. Obviously, God worked it out so that he would. But he didn't know these people. I got to tell you, in my prayer life, and yours is probably the same to a certain extent, and this is not a matter of right or wrong or even good or bad. It's, it's a matter of being uh, maybe a little more aware. I want to be a little more aware in my, in my prayer life. My immediate reaction when I'm engaging in prayer is to pray for people that I know. Yours is probably the same, right? I start with my family, my biological family, my wife, my kids, my brother, his kids, all that kind of stuff. I shift over to you guys, people that I know people that I know especially that are struggling with things. There is nothing wrong with that, by the way. Not one single thing. Those are people we absolutely 100% should be praying for. What Paul is showing us here, though, anybody want to guess what what the official statistic is for how many Christians there are in this world? Now, these are people who claim Christianity. Doesn't necessarily mean they actually are. But there's a number. Anybody want to hazard a guess as to how many uh, Christians there are allegedly on the planet today? Huh? 100 million. What did you say? 700 million. 2.4 billion. Now, I think we can probably all agree. Probably not all Christians, right? 
But these are people that claim Christianity or that go to a church that, that is a Christian church or claim connection to some quarter Christian uh, denomination. Now let's say that 50% of them, right, we're still talking about over a billion people, the vast majority of which, this side of heaven, you and I will never see. We will never meet. You guys heard me use the example that I've used so many times in the past, the Chinese peanut farmer on the other side of the world who happens to be a believer. I have more in common with that person than any family member, biological family member I have that doesn't know Christ. And I will never meet that person. I will never have a conversation with them. Our cultures couldn't be any different. But that doesn't matter. I want to be more intentional about praying for all of my family, especially those people I will never meet. Listen to the love and the care that Paul has for people. He has no, he couldn't pick them out of a lineup. Didn't have one connection to them other than the most important connection, the one that makes us a family in the first place. By the way, we have the ultimate example of what it looks like to pray for basically everyone. And that is found, of course, in John's Gospel. I want to read this. I, this is a lot of verses here, but I want, you to, I, want, I want to read this. This is extremely important for us to be able to understand. This is just before Jesus is being arrested. And one of the last things he does before his arrest, at least according to John's Gospel, is, is that he prays. And his prayer takes up the entirety of the 17th chapter. He prays for himself. He prays for his disciples, the 11 that are left. And lastly, he prays for us. Every single believer on the planet for the last 2,000 years and counting is who he's praying for. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of this world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know you in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, that you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I guarded them. And not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of this world just as I am not of this world. I do not ask you that you take them out of the world but you keep them from the evil one for they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth and so you sent me in the world and so I have sent them into the world for their sake I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth and here in verse 20 he shifts over to praying for everybody else every single member of his adopted family 2,000 years ago before he was arrested he prayed for us I do not ask for these only meaning the 12 the 11 but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. And they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them. That they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me. 
that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love the Father. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I have made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love in which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. We are family. And he was praying for his adopted children all of his adopted children, me, you, if you were saved, born again, 2,000 years ago. You know what we do with family? We pray for them a lot. The ones we know, the ones we don't know, and will never know this side of heaven. You love your family, you truly understand it, then you pray for them. And lastly, we'll finish up here. We treat our family by longing to be with them. This one is huge. By longing to be with them, in verse 11, For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. I long to be with you. You know, I've been here now for several Christmases. And it never fails. As soon as Christmas is over and we're back for our first service, I ask people, they ask me, how was your Christmas? Did you enjoy your holidays? Whatever the terminology is. Every single time, even when I don't bring it up, which generally I don't, people will respond to me what the best part of their holidays was. And that is spending time with family. Even if I don't ask them, did you get to spend time with family? Did, was there anybody that came down? It's automatically volunteered. How was your Christmas? Oh, it's great my mom came down. Oh, it's great I saw my brother. Oh, it's great we have that longing to be with family. This is our family. We have to long. The word here means to yearn, but it has a preposition attached, which gives it an intensification. It intensifies the word to really yearn, to really long to be with our family, even the ones we don't like. And there will be family members you're not all that crazy about. The Bible doesn't promise anything any different than that. Just like with biological families, there are those in our Christian family who at times may actually rub us the wrong way. I know, you're shocked. But it doesn't matter. Paul said, I long to be with you. I yearn to be with you. He had no idea who these people were. He had no idea if there were going to be personality conflicts. He had no idea if there were going to be disagreements. You want to know why? It didn't matter. They're family. And Paul, by the way, had his share of disagreements. Did he not? Paul, I try to imagine in my mind, there are a few people in history that I admire more than I admire the Apostle Paul for a lot of different reasons. But I bet that guy was a bear to be around. A bear to be around. He had issues with Barnabas. He had issues with Mark. He had issues with Peter. He had issues with the Corinthian church, segments of the Corinthian church. He had issues with the entire Galatian church. Paul had issues with, you see the common theme in all of those, by the way? They're all Paul. I am especially fascinated by Paul's disagreement with Barnabas and Mark, if you're not familiar with that, it got bad. I mean, like really bad. <laughs> when the Bible says it got so contentious that, I mean, it's a way of telling you that, yeah, this is, this is really bad. These are family members. These are people that love each other. If you're not familiar with the story, you can find it in Acts. Paul goes out on his missionary journey. He takes his friend Barnabas and he takes Barnabas's cousin, a guy referred to as John Mark. In Acts, it's actually the same Mark that wrote the Gospel Mark. So even though he's called John Mark, it's the same guy. Luke was very kind to Mark by just saying halfway through the thing that, that Mark left. Didn't say why, didn't say under what circumstances, just say Mark left. 
So they come back after their first missionary journey. They're getting ready to go on their next missionary journey. They want to go back to the same places where they were and started all of these church. And Barnabas says, I'm going to give you the, uh, the Reader's Digest version here. Barnabas says, yeah, let me go get John Mark and we'll be ready to go. And Paul said, he's not coming with us. He abandoned us on the last one. That's the only indication we get that what Mark did was something negative. He didn't just go home because he broke his leg. Went home because he actually abandoned them. Paul said he's not coming with us because he abandoned us. Barnabas said, well, you know, he's family, so yeah, he's going with us. And the scripture tells us that it got so contentious that Barnabas took John Mark and went his separate way. Paul took Silas and went his separate way. Yeah, we're going to have some irritating family members. There's no two ways about that. But you know, that's not where that story ends, by the way. This is really cool. That complete story with Paul and John Mark actually wraps up in 2 Timothy. Probably Paul's last, chronologically last letter. He's in prison for the second time, not a house arrest prison like he was in Rome the first time where he had a lot of comfort. He's literally in chains, and when he's writing to Timothy, he asks for three things. His Bible, his coat because he was cold, and he asked for Mark and said, send Mark to me because I could really use him. That's what family does. I got to tell you, I have run across a lot of believers over the years that for some reason known only to them have a tendency to want to spend more time with people who are not believers than people who are, than people who are believers. I got to tell you right now, I don't get that at all. I don't get that. I don't understand why anybody would not want to be around our family members. I don't, I don't understand why they would openly and clearly choose to be around people who do not hold sacred to them the most important thing that you would hold sacred. In 1 Peter 4, 3 through 4, Paul talk, uh, Peter talks about this. For the time that is past, meaning our past lives, for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles, when you hear Gentiles here, just think unsaved. That's just a euphemism for people who are lost. To do what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them. They are surprised when you do not join them and in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. When you spend an inordinate amount of time with people who are not your family, they are absolutely going to expect you to do what they do. And if you don't, there is something wrong with you. The reality is, there is something wrong with us. We're infected with Jesus. So it's going to look like that to them. You guys know, I didn't know this. I read this article some time back. Do you guys know that Nashville is not only the home to country music, but it actually, I don't know if it still is, but at least when this started, it was the home to the contemporary Christian music movement? I didn't know that. Did you guys know that? I, I don't, I didn't, I, not that I really cared, but I just thought it was fascinating that it ended up there in Nashville. In the late 70s and into the 80s when the contemporary Christian music scene just exploded, all the people that wanted to be in contemporary Christian music all went to Nashville, just like all the, everybody that wants to go to the country music goes to Nashville. So Nashville became the hub, the single point at which all of these people went. And uh, the, I saw this article that was, uh, that was talking about that, that whole thing I was reading. Uh, uh, it was, had something to do with something else, but it, it touched on this. And they were interviewing one of the executives from the record company there. And he told a very interesting story. He said, you know, when those guys came here, you could, you could see it in their eyes and hear it in their voice and their actions, how much they loved the Lord and they couldn't wait to serve him. and They were going to use their music to honor and glorify him and all of this other stuff. And he said, that didn't last too long until they started doing the exact same thing that secular artists were doing. They had the same problems with sexual immorality. They had the same problems with drugs. They had the same problems with alcohol. They had the same problems with promiscuity. In fact, 
I didn't know this. He said, amongst the executives there in Nashville, a saying developed. Here was the saying. Nashville changed more Christians than Christians changed Nashville. Because they had embedded themselves, not with their family. They embedded themselves with a world who had an expectation you were going to do what they were going to do, what they were doing. You're the, you're the weirdo. You're the strange one if you're not, if you're not doing that stuff. You know, I, I'm a... I'm a, you, I mentioned earlier, I'm a huge fan of Job. I'm, I love that book. I love everything about it. There are so many quotable moments in that, in that book. One of my favorites that I use all the time is when Job, hearing the completely inane suggestions and offers of help from his friends, where they were completely wrong about everything they were saying about him, responded with this. Your platitudes are proverbs of ash. I love that. I use it all the time. Your platitudes are proverbs of ash. And it's not just there. It's any platitude. If you know, platitude is just a quip that really doesn't basically have. Yeah, can I give you an example of a platitude? Please don't get mad if you've said this before. I'm not really talking about you. I'm talking about somebody else. But if you've ever heard the quip, we need to let go and let God, oh, don't get me started. That doesn't mean anything. What does that mean? Nobody knows what it means. It sounds kind of cool, but nobody knows what it means. That's a platitude. It's a saying that really doesn't have any depth to it or any structure to it, which is why he calls them Proverbs of Ash. You ever ran your fingers through ash? There is nothing there. It's like moving it through air. And when it comes to this whole thing, because it is a balance for us, isn't it? Are we, as believers, are we supposed to engage with the world? Yes, we are. Are we, we're not, God is not, he doesn't have an isolationist strategy for us where we just go and huddle together with believers and we never engage with the world. We clearly do, but there is this balance there. Between how we do that, how often we do that, and what under, under what circumstances. Ultimately, what the scripture seems to be telling us is that when we engage with, engage with the lost world, it's for the idea of the propagation of the gospel. Not to do what they're doing, but in order to be able to communicate the gospel. But we have too many people out there that still like to hang out with people who are not their family members. And you know the platitude they always use drives me insane. Absolutely insane. Well, you know, when Jesus was here, he hung out with sinners. You ever heard that one? Oh, if, you have, if you've ever said that, don't say it again. I'm begging you. Don't say it again because it is factually incorrect. Jesus engaged with sinners. He hung out with his family. He hung out with those 11 people. I'm not counting Judas. He hung out with those 11 people. That's who he hung out with. We should long to be with our family. There's this amazing passage, of course, also written by Paul in 2 Corinthians. And too many times we hear this verse and we have to think, oh, he's only talking about marriage here. He's not. Listen to the words. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? What do you possibly have in common with this person that you would want to spend this kind of... Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you. You shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. If you really and truly understand what, what God is saying here about, about this extended family, this family that we have, literal family that we have, one of the things that Paul is trying to teach us here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is spend time with your family. 
even the ones you don't know and the ones you don't like. I'm not trying to give a pass. Uh, can I just, I've, I've always valued our honesty. I hope you value it as much as I do. Are there some Christians out there who are jerks? You can say it. Yes! I wish that was not the case. But there are. I have run across a few. I really hope I'm not one of them. Because to them, maybe I'm the jerk, right? It's all a matter of perspective, by the way. Is it okay to not want to spend the amount of time, a long amount of time with somebody that rubs you the wrong way? Yeah, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. There's some folks sitting here right now. I wouldn't spend one hour with you. I'm just messing around. I, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It'd be funny if the, if the tape just cut off there, right? And I was like, but I told them I was kidding. No, it's okay. That's all right. But they're still family. They're still family. And are connected to you in a way nobody else on this planet is. Unless it's another family member. We had a new couple move in next door to the house next door to us not too long ago. And so we're, you know, trying to be neighborly and, and we're sitting there chatting a little bit. And after a while of talking, I kind of got the feeling that they, they might be believers. So I said something to them about it. They said, oh, yeah, yeah, we go to this church. I mean, immediately there was a change. Immediately there was a connection. I didn't know them any better <laughs> than I knew them two seconds before they told me that. I didn't know. There was nothing personal that, I, that they that, that ingratiated me to them or them to me in any way, shape, or form. The moment I found out that they were a believer and the moment they, that, I, that they found out that I was, it changed everything. It changed everything. My goodness, we are literally a family. It's like the professor and the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. If I could give us the same advice he gave the Pevensey kids, you're a family. You should try to act like it. That's what this passage is trying to tell us here. Paul doesn't even know these people. And he's saying, I cannot wait to be with you. Now, maybe after he got there, he might have been saying, I can't wait to get away from you. But that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't long to be with people who don't share. Did you hear that passage? What has Christ got to do with somebody who's... Not a Christian. What, what does this, how could you, you, don't have, you have nothing in common with these people is ultimately what he's saying. Love your family. Thank God for them. Pray for them. And yearn, yearn to be with them. Let's pray, Father God. I thank you for the opportunity that you have given us here this morning, Lord, to read your word, to engage it, to have you engage us, Lord, with understanding of who you are and what you've called us to do, Lord. And I thank you that when you adopted me as your child, that you did not adopt me as an only child. Ultimately, in this universe, Lord, the only thing I have is you. But one of the great benefits that you have given me as a believer while I'm still on this planet is a family. And I pray that I will love my family, that I will thank God for my family, that I will pray for my family, that I will long to be with my family before I would long to be with anybody else on this planet, Lord, that I would long to be with the family that you have placed me in, you adopted me into this family. May we truly see that, Lord, and understand the importance of that as we continue on with the lives that you have given us on this planet. And I thank you for our time here this morning, Lord. I pray that you are lifted up and glorified and people will be drawn into you. For it's in the precious name of Jesus I pray. Amen.